Welcome, everyone. I'm Herminia Ibarra, Professor of Organizational Behavior at the London Business School. And our sessions this afternoon is part of the Jobs Reset Summit, a platform for bringing together leaders across all sectors to address the big questions of the day concerning growth, jobs, skills, and equity. The idea is to create solutions together and to really accelerate action towards more inclusive, fair, and sustainable workplaces, societies, and organizations. Our theme for today, which is the fourth and final day, is equity, inclusion, and social justice. So with today's discussions, we really want to try to get at how the current disruption in the economy, in labor markets, can be leveraged to embed greater social justice and ensure greater opportunity for all. Our panel is about developing leaders for this great reset. We have a fabulous panel um, with Vijay Eswaran, Executive Chairman of QI Group in Malaysia. Jill Ader, Chairwoman of Egon Zender in the UK. Uh, Brian Gallagher, President and CEO, United Way Worldwide in the US. And Karen Van Bergen, Dean of Omnicon University and Executive Vice President of the Omnicon Group. Just to give you a flow of the session, we're gonna be spending approximately the next 25 minutes or so in discussion with the panelists. Um, at 30 minutes into the session, we're going to be concluding the live stream portion and move into 15 minutes of Q&A uh, with the top link participants. Um, before we begin, I just want to say we'd love your comments and questions from the top link audience and you can write those into the chat box. And I'm going to get us started um, interactively with a poll. Uh, the poll is this. Uh, which of the following characteristics, and you can pick your top two, uh, do you expect from a leader? Decisive, empathetic, collaborative, transparent, persuasive, or something else? Okay, I choose. Okay. All right. Very interesting. So empathetic gets the top um, votes, uh, followed by decisive, transparent, collaborative, persuasive less. And, and uh, it looks like we got the good, uh, the good adjectives in that not many people have written uh, some other ones. So fantastic, um, and that is a good jumping board for asking my first question of the panel um, to Jill Ader. Um, Jill, uh, given your line of work, um, I really like your sense of what leadership competencies uh, do we need these days uh, to navigate you know, everything, all the, the consequences of the pandemic, including the fact that our workplaces are changing, including that they're moving towards a more hybrid uh, way of working. What kind of leadership is needed in this context? Absolutely. I think it's about navigating with very human answers. I think that's what I'd first say. I think we're seeing uh, uh, an incredible melting pot of everything that is hitting us in this pandemic. And what that is causing is a meltdown of some leaders, whereas others are rising to the occasion and shining. So I think what we're going to see is more demand for leaders and less supply. Uh, that's what we're already seeing. The, the hard stuff continues, you know, hard in inverted commas continues to be really important. So resilience, delivering results, performance, uh, all very important. But actually what's coming to the fore is the importance of the soft stuff, which is really hard. Um, so that's the human factors, the care, the compassion, the trust. And I think overall, I'd say that people have got to, leaders have got to look at what's the psychological safety and trust that I'm, I'm generating now and, and gauge every one of their actions and behaviors by, by looking at that, that psychological safety and trust. So we see three or four shifts going on. One is from invincibility, and I agree people have to be decisive, but not recklessly decisive. So it's, it's actually going from invincibility to vulnerability or humility, however you like to talk about it, um, because leaders don't know all the answers now and people have to feel engaged uh, and they have to be able to talk about their fears. 
The second one is leaders are typically extremely busy doing and knowing a lot. And this shift is about being the leader. Because in a crisis, people in the organization want to know and feel the essence and reassurance of their leaders, not see them heads down. Uh, the third one is purpose and values. If you can anchor in purpose and values, then literally you're giving people the reason to carry on working so hard and be collaborative. To, to miss out on the purpose is literally missing the point. Um, and then the fourth one is, is really about, um, are, are you really taking into account everything that's so important now that society expects? So what's your license to operate on diversity, equity, and inclusion, on sustainability, stakeholder management? So when we're looking at leaders, we're looking at, yeah, yes, what's their experience, but we're looking at their potential. And the biggest driver of potential is curiosity. And that's, that, that's so important at the moment. So we look at potential and actually, Hamina, your work on identity is spot on because what we see is those leaders who have been able to make the identity shift and move from stuckness or being a crisis manager into knowing they are holding an organization and breathing life and safety into an organization or whatever their version of that is, um, that makes a huge difference. So when we're coaching CEOs, we're looking at their cognitive awareness, their emotional awareness, and also their somatic awareness. You know, how are they bringing that to life in their aura, just the, the, the spirit and essence that they give off. Um, so those are the things that we're looking at. It's definitely the hard stuff of resilience and performance, but it, you can't just perform. Uh, it's about transforming, otherwise your organization can't transform. Yeah. It is a massive shift from some of the ways of operating before. And I'll, I was curious, as you were saying, that there is rising demand and less supply is part of that, the difficulty of making those transitions and making those shifts um, that are really a, a kind of what got you here won't get you there situation. Um, the, a lot of the old skills no longer seem to apply. Exactly. And, and also the, the shortage of supply will continue unless leaders really invest in their own development even though they're, they're incredibly busy at the moment. Their development is so important. Hmm. Fantastic. All right. Um, um, Vijay, if we could have your take on the poll, and I know um, you're also eager to share with us some of your, your ideas about stakeholder capitalism and what that means uh, for investing in a better future and, and reset. Um, I find the poll to be um, fascinating. I think that uh, leaders are going to, uh, in essence, need um, a little bit of all these attributes, but um, I'm a strong believer in decisive leadership, but I think empathy would be a very powerful selling point for a leader. Understanding the people that he leads is fundamentally the basis of uh, good leadership. Integrity, something that's not there, is something that I would have added on because I think that's really what we lack uh, in terms of leaders today, because leaders today, uh, in essence, are uh, out for themselves more than anything else. And uh, survival of the fittest doesn't really fit into uh, the aspect of leadership that uh, I would uh, sub subscribe to. So having said that, the issue would be, uh, the worst combination there would be, in essence, to be decisive and at the same time persuasive then you're heading into the region of uh, some of the worst dictatorships that we have had, you know, uh, going all the way back to Hitler himself. So I would think that uh, uh, the leaders of today, particularly leaders that are going to be coming into this new norm, so to speak, have to understand uh, and relate to the people that they're leading with. Uh, and being decisive is something that's critically important because they're not going to make right decisions. Right decisions actually is something that you work your way towards. You know, the first decision you make may not be right and usually is not right. So the point is to keep working until eventually you get the decision right. But honest leadership requires you to admit and deal with the mistakes that you're going to make. And I think you would get a lot more out of the people that you're leading if you are pretty much um, honest in, in the fact that you can make mistakes. I would rather have a leader 
that uh, recognizes that than one who thinks is infallible. Mm -hmm. So, so much for leadership. Moving into investor, um, sorry, a stakeholder capitalism. Um, I was a, a product of an era where Milton Friedman, in essence, you know, built this whole concept of shareholder capitalism. And shareholder capitalism resulted in Wall Street going, in a sense, berserk. And uh, the last few decades are an example of where capitalism has taken on, in essence, uh, a new form. I would imagine that uh, picking the carcass of companies and tearing them apart just in, in order to make prof profits over the years has become a lifestyle. And um, so uh, I, I imagine at some point they're going to have to, if we continue with shareholder capitalism, then that bull that's up there in Wall Street needs to become a vulture. Having said that, moving on to what I think is critically important right now is the fact that um, stakeholder capitalism requires us to be aware of the other stakeholders in, in, uh, in everything that we do, which includes your employees for a start. You know? And that's a very important start because it's people that are going to make the difference moving ahead. They, we need to basically upskill them and upskill them we have to prepare them for the new norm moving ahead. And uh, many of them are going to be out of a job, phenomenally so. And uh, we're gonna to have to recognize that the most important element is to retool and upskill and upscale moving ahead because that's really the norm that we are heading into. And faster we get things done, the faster we are able to adjust to the new norm. Uh, in terms of the company, QI, we are an e-commerce based platform and we are scattered across uh, four continents and we have close to 15 million people in the database. So we are, need to be in constant engagement. So the empathetic part of leadership is very critical. If uh, we were able to turn around during this time, it was primarily due to the engagement. So market feedback is a critical component both online feedback and offline feedback. And uh, because we have a composition of where direct sales and uh, e-commerce is the, uh, the platforms that we use to basically do business across the world, both of these, the online and offline uh, feedback systems were critical in us re-engineering, redesigning, and in, in, in essence, redesigning the wheel as it were. So we had to do this on the move, on the fly. And uh, fortunately, we were able to actually survive, if not to some extent, begin to thrive in the midst of this uh, pandemic. Fantastic. And, uh, um, if I could just make a connection across the yeah. two, and this is a word that hasn't actually really come up yet, but it has to do with, with learning and a learning orientation. Mm -hmm. Um, you've talked a lot, Vijay, about mistakes, and that's the world we're in. And if you're uh, also working on market feedback, this is an iterate and learn kind of approach and not an invincibility, we get it right at the outset uh, kind of approach. And that's there's a direct link uh, to the psychological safety Jill's been talking about. The research on that is very clearly uh, from Amy Edmondson, you frame for learning. You don't frame for getting it right at the outset. You frame for learning and you make a shift from being what Satya Nadella called know-it-alls to learn-it-alls. And that's mm -hmm. that. I'm already seeing that as a strong theme across our comments. I'd like to turn uh, next uh, to Brian. Um, Brian, um, you've got some examples for us of uh, some innovative leadership practices that you're seeing help build resilience in this context. Can you share a bit of that with us, please? Sure. Um, well, let me first say that kind of building on VJ and, and Jill's comments, I, I think the uh, leadership and the reset has to begin and be centered in rebuilding trust. Um, trust, in, trust in institutions across the world, for sure, government institutions, businesses, even, even NGOs, media, uh, have been crushed over the last number of years. Uh, inequality has been a big issue in the across the world, there's a question of globalism and am I, am I benefiting by all this economic activity or is it some narrow portion of leaders that are, that are benefiting? So we've got to begin with thinking about trust. The, 
the societies in the countries that have the highest trust numbers have the lowest inequality and then have a, a sense of collect, you know, collective purpose. And so the examples really, for me, center there. Um, you know, secondly, and, and to this, to the point of the examples I want to bring forward, if once you focus on trust, the way to sustain it is to focus on people designed systems. You know, the pandemic and the economic fallout has laid bare in many countries, certainly here in the US, that our systems are have failed. And that you can have a healthcare system that's high quality, efficient, just in time, but is a horrible response in a, in a public health crisis. And so um, putting people first and the way people define their success is personal safety, economic security. I don't wanna get rich, I just wanna be able to sustain myself and my family. A sense of purpose. If you don't have a sense of purpose, um, uh, you drift. And then connecting to something larger in community. And if you're not connected to something larger, you're going to find yourself radicalized or off the, off the economic track and become a drag on society, not a contributor. A couple of examples. Uh, Mark Benioff, the, the founder of Salesforce, um, headquartered in San Francisco here in the U.S., San Francisco, like a lot of cities in the U.S., has a, a huge homelessness uh, issue. And, you know, the leadership that Mark showed was um, being supportive of a tax referendum to tax businesses more in order to provide more support services to people who are chronically homeless. That's putting people first. You know, there's an economic interest for Salesforce and businesses in San Francisco, but for a, a corporate leader to say, we should be taxed more to provide more services to folks who are homeless on the street is the kind of leadership and example that I think builds trust and confidence. I visited uh, a number of countries the last, um, you know, starting two years ago, looking at migration patterns and, and I can't get into all of them, but I think what uh, German Chancellor Merkel has done and her government did and has done in terms of dealing with the refugee crisis is an example of unbelievable leadership. Uh, that was a political risk to accept that number of refugees from the, from the Middle East, mostly Syria. And when you visit into, um, in, in Germany to see how they're trying to uh, integrate these new refugees into society, it's universities, it's businesses, it's NGO, it's government, and it's making sure that, that these new refugees become, become part of German society. Um, it, is, it was a huge, I think, unbelievable example of um, the kind of leadership that we need going forward. In both Mark's case and in the Chancellor's case, they took huge risk, got outside their comfort zone, and went across sectors. Last thing I would say is um, everything has to, I, I, it's not surprising to me that the poll would say collaborative. Um, the, uh, everything has to be cross-sector now. It has to be around inclusiveness. If you're not focused on your employees, on your citizens, on your customers, and building the systems from, for them and not for you as leaders, long-term will fail. Last, last thing I would say is um, this can't be short-term. You know, the Great Reset is not going to happen in 60 days. Um, it's going to be the Great Reset and the Great Rebuild. And in order to rebuild differently. We've got to reimagine the future and it can't be a race to the bottom. It has to be an, an imagination to something different. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. I'm hearing uh, one very clear indicator towards action, and that is to both get higher trust and a greater sense of collective purpose, action against or towards in, uh, lowering inequality is probably a best bet uh, for a leader. Um, Karen, I want to turn to you next. I don't know if you'd like to comment on the poll, um, but I particularly want to ask you uh, a follow on on this, which is how can we ensure equity and inclusion remain front and center in this time of crisis when it can be so tempting to say this is not of the essence, we've got to get things better before we can focus on those luxury items. Yeah, I know with regard to the poll, um, I was definitely the decisive empathetic and I wanted to add collaborative, but I wasn't allowed to do a third one. Um, I love the integrity as well uh, that Vijay said. Um, I think if Brian already alluded to it, uh, if the current crisis had made one thing 
crystal clear is that the lack of e equity has had a devastating impact on the global population. And therefore, in this time of crisis, there are two arguments to double down on, on addressing uh, equity. Uh, the first one is a moral one um, because of that devastating impact. Companies, the private sector is able to have such a positive impact on the communities in which it operates that we need to really, really continue to, to support any initiatives for, for equity, uh, for a moral obligation. But there's also, there's overwhelming evidence that it makes total strategic business sense that when you have diversity, which cannot exist without uh, equity and inclusion, um, that you come to better business solutions and better uh, long-term business uh, impact. So, um, and I would say now more than ever, and, and, and Brian again alluded to it already, how a company shows up in this time of crisis will have a long lasting impact on its stakeholders. Um, current employees, future employees, consumers, anybody else who's a stakeholder in your company. So you have to think about the actions you take. And there are uh, companies that have stepped up. And personally, you know, I work for Omnicom. I was incredibly proud of our company that um, in July, our CEO um, stepped up our efforts on diversity, equity, and inclusion and, and published a, um, our, our uh, we call it Open 2.0 plan that has seven very concrete action points to uh, create systemic equity across Omnicom. Um, and, uh, and the most important one is that he laid out accountability up to the highest level himself. Um, and I think that's how, we, that's how we need to operate in a time of, of crisis. Um, We've also doubled down um, on our support for the, the UN sustainability goals, and we've always been concentrating on education. And I am a passionate believer that if you don't address education, you cannot address e equality and equity. So, um, you know, as Sonia Sotomayor, the, the Supreme Court judge once said, until we get equality in education, we won't have an equal society. So I think all of us need to double down in this time of crisis I love the fact that, that we can talk to each other, share best practices and continue to learn because we haven't found the solution yet. So we need to share best practices and be accountable to each other. Can I ask you a follow on just specifically, you know, just recently I have been um, reading just a spate of different studies coming out, just showing how a lot of the things we try to do in organizations to somehow fix or mitigate the, the problem of inequality of diversity and inclusion just don't work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at the same time, we've got this crisis here that has mobilized us in so many ways, you know, look at all we can do online that we never thought possible. What becomes possible as a result of this crisis that can have better chances of getting the kind of impact we've been trying to achieve for so long? So I would say the transparency, I would say that talking to each other, um, being very open about what works um, and what doesn't work and take, you know, really take accountability for, for the role we can play. You know, there's, there's, again, yes, it's easy to say, well, we shouldn't do trainings, etc. I think we should do and and we should do we should keep doing the trainings that 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 have have a positive impact. But I think I am a firm believer in sharing best practices between companies and organizations and talk talking to each other um, and then engage all your stakeholders in that discussion. And for, first and foremost, your own employees. Fantastic. Uh, we have um, a few minutes to just kind of talk across and to each other. The, um, lots of really interesting inputs that really keep bringing me back to the question of how we learn from each other and how we learn from the different sectors and how we not assume uh, that we're going to get it right at the outset and just kind of practice a, a, an approach in which we get better at learning. Anybody want to jump in and add to this? And also, oh, the transparency wasn't at the top of the list, but I see that also coming in as a, as a really important factor in trust, in learning. Um, what can we add, especially around examples of, of, of what's bringing these new leadership models to life? Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead, Jill. Jill, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, being very honest with ourselves about what are the stories we tell ourselves, both as individuals and as uh, companies, because sometimes we tell ourselves things. I was talking to a CEO this morning where we'd just done a very uh, diverse search for him. And, and I said, did you make any compromise? And he said, no, but, you know, so many people tell me that there isn't diversity out there. Or, you know, we, we tell ourselves stories. 
Um, and I think we have to be really curious about those stories. Mm -hmm. What I what I was gonna what I was gonna say is um, in terms of learning as a discipline, I'm not sure we know right now how we create knowledge in this in this time. You know, so we have the we have the historic. I don't mean academic is in terms of scholarly academic, but a kind of a a disciplined um, event learn event learn. But we live in a, um, a just-in-time um, exchange of information and artificial intelligence that is um, at breakneck speed giving us input as leaders, as citizens. And we're not sure, we, we, my guess is that the, the way we've created knowledge historically is too slow. And the way that we're exchanging information and, and quote learning is really not knowledge quite often. It's just exchange of information. And so the question becomes, I think, how do we, how do we create disciplines um, to exchange in real time with large numbers of stakeholders in order to create an understanding and knowledge? If you look at I was, in a, I was in a meeting recently with mayors of large cities across the world, and they're using digital technology to allow their citizens to talk to them in real time yeah. and to watch patterns of behavior so they can change trash pickup or, or you know, mass transit routing and so forth. It's, that's knowledge. And this idea that we can sit together and tell you what we did eight months ago for you then to learn to, to then do something eight months later it's just right. not the way the world works today. Great example. I'm going to turn to Vijay quickly. We're not going to need to wrap up this portion in about a minute and a half. And I'd like to get a few last words uh, from Vijay and from Karen. Well, in terms of diversity, it's important to remember that both in terms of our workplace, as in terms of employees, as well as customers, there is a tremendous changes actually occurred right now. And that's simply the fact that we have to deal with the millennials, uh, we have to deal with the centennials and now the gen alphas and all of that. And, and these people are the people who are inheriting all of these issues that we have uh, you know, encountered up to now. And their thinking styles and difference uh, is something that's very important to take into account because they are different. Okay, I'm going to go to Karen with our last uh, couple of minutes, but I think it, you're saying, VJ, we've got a lot of material to work with out there. Karen, Absolutely. please. Yeah, no, I, I firmly believe in, in that learning culture and, and the focus on education and whatever the private sector can do to work to help there. Um, and as Brian said, you, you, the, 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 the way we're working virtually now uh, will enable that faster learning and sharing best practices. Fantastic. Thank you so much to our panelists and for our public.